Um, so I have the, the great pleasure to introduce one of our uh, two um, uh, lead and, and then anchor speakers, our, our keynote speakers, and I really have the pleasure to introduce both of them. So first, um, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Bob Langer, and I won't read his whole bio, uh, it's in your program, but um, he's really just an incredibly impressive entrepreneurial individual and engineer. He's, he's really the entrepreneurial engineer of the century, I think it's fair to say. He's written over 1,500 articles with 360,000 citations. He has the highest uh, citation index of any engineer in history and actually the fourth highest of anyone in the sciences. So just from a scientific perspective, incredible achievements. He's a member of the National Academy of Medicine, the National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Sciences, and the National Academy of Inventors. Now, if that weren't enough, he also basically has driven and grown the culture of entrepreneurship at MIT, where he's been a professor for many years. He uh, has pa patents that have been licensed or sublicensed to over 400 companies, and he's founded many, many, many companies, including Moderna, a company that people may have heard of that um, is one of the leading uh, vaccine companies uh, in the world. Now, he also chaired the FDA Science Board, its highest science advisory board in the past. So we're really excited to have Dr. Langer speak about his sort of journey in entrepreneurship and where he's going now in kind of the area of food and nutrition. So welcome, Dr. Langer. Thank you, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to, to speak to you. I'll probably go pretty fast just to give you a high-level overview of what we tried to do. So I'm a chemical engineer, as was mentioned. But when I got done in, with my degree in 1974, pretty much all my colleagues went to work for the oil industry. And I wasn't that excited about doing that. And I ended up going to work at Boston Children's Hospital. And I was the only engineer there. And the, if we could just go to the very first slide. Um, OK, I guess I can just do this. Uh, Dr. Folkman, who was my boss, he, he offered me a job. And by the way, it was the lowest paying job by far of, of all the ones I got. Certainly nothing like the oil companies. But at any rate, his idea was that if you could stop blood vessels, that might be a whole new way of treating cancer. And, um, and, and so my job was to prove he was right. Most people felt it made no sense. Uh, but uh, and actually, in so doing, isolate the first blood vessel inhibitors. But one of the th th key things uh, it, it, that, it, it, this was his idea, anti-angiogenesis. One of the key things whenever you try to do something like this is you have to have a bioassay, a way to study this. And there wasn't any, so we had to invent one. And what we wanted to invent was a, a drug delivery system that could be put in the body or in an animal or in an egg that could deliver large molecules. All the angiogenesis inhibitors were large molecules. But Dr. Folkman then asked people, like he was, I was just a young guy, he asked people, he was on a board of the only company in the world, Alza, that was doing any drug delivery work. And they had Nobel Prize winners on their board and very famous people. They all told him, well, you really couldn't have a delivery system, a tiny little particle that could deliver large molecules because they were too big. It's kind of like to get through. It's kind of like any of us walking through a wall. We couldn't get through. Um, on the other hand, you know, if we were ever going to solve the angiogenesis problem, we had to have a way to do this. So I spent two years working in the laboratory. I actually found over 200 ways to get this to not work. <laughs> but, but eventually, I made little microspheres or nanospheres. And th these are, are some pictures. And we published in the journal Nature um, the fact that you could deliver any molecule for over, uh, you know, for a long time. In fact, this was the first paper ever that showed you could really deliver nucleic acids, which I'll come to later. Um, nonetheless, I remember giving a lecture on this about three months before um, the Nature paper, we, we published it. And, you know, I was 27 years old. I remember practicing this talk for weeks when there were all these famous chemists there in the audience. And I thought when I was done, I did okay. I didn't forget too much what I was going to say. So I thought all these older scientists being nice people would, would want to encourage me, this young guy. But when I stepped off the podium, a whole bunch of them came up to me and they said, we don't believe anything you just said. <laughs> uh, basically, what they said were, again, that the large molecules couldn't get through the mater solid materials. Also, the solvents we were using, which were like ethanol or methylene chloride, they would destroy whatever we would put in. Um, and by the way, things went downhill from there. My, my first nine grants to the government, like NIH, they were all soundly rejected. And like I say, I'm a chemical engineer. 
I applied to faculty positions. No chemical engineering department in the world would hire me. They all said this bio stuff doesn't make any sense. So finally, I got a job in, in actually a nutrition department, MIT's. And uh, the man who hired me was Nevin Scrimshaw, who was a very famous nutritionist. And, and he knew Dr. Folkman. Uh, he was on that ALSA board too. And Dr. Folkman introduced me and he liked me. But I don't know if any of you ever met Dr. Scrimshaw. He was a wonderful man. But he was also what I'd call a benevolent dictator kind of department head. So he liked me, so he offered me the job. But he didn't bother to ask anybody else in the department what they thought. And that would have been OK, except the year after I joined the department, he left. So a lot of the senior faculty decided to give me advice, and they said I, I should leave too. In fact, uh, Mike Marletta, who was one of my friends, Mike is a member of National Academy of Science. He's very famous. Uh, he, he, I'll just read this. He, he was giving this talk about me a few years ago when I got some award. And he just said, well, one evening, he went to a faculty dinner with me and some senior professors. He said, a senior scientist said, quizzing us while smoking a cigar. He said, when the older scientists heard my uh, concepts for drug delivery, he blew a cloud of smoke in my face and said, you better start looking for another job. So that wasn't so good. But anyhow, I kept I put my head down. And eventually, we were, you know, we'd made these nanoparticles, and we could use them for delivery systems. I apologize for the next slide, but there's no other way to show blood vessel growth. So this is the rabbit eye assay we used. It's a paper we published in Science in 1976. And on the left, you see what happens uh, a few weeks after you put a tumor in without any inhibitor or with an inhibitor that didn't work, of which I found many. Um, but you see all the sheets of blood vessels, whereas on the, on the right, uh, see how they're sparser. They avoid the tumor. And what's amazing is 100% of the time, the tumors on the left grew. And we did 2,000 of these. It was whereas 60% uh, 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 of the time, uh, these tumors never grew. So that showed, uh, we published that in 1976. Still, it took another 28 years and great work by lots of companies like Genentech before the first angiogenesis inhibitor was approved. But, and you may not be able to see this so well in the back, but it doesn't really matter. What you see is starting in 2004, 28 years after this, you see one after the next after the next angiogenesis inhibitor approved by FDA. And Avast in the first of these, um, is uh, probably the number two or three best-selling biotech drug in history. And many others, like Ilea and Lucentis that are up there, they're not only tr cancer treatments, but also treatments for diseases in the back of the eye, like macular degeneration, which is the leading cause of blindness in the United States. One of the other things, and this is important for entrepreneurship, that Dr. Folkman mentioned to me, said, Bob, we should file a patent. You know, so that might seem quite common for those of you that you know, heard my introduction. But, um, but you know, in the 1970s, Boston Children's Hospital, or it was, they'd never had a patent. So we filed for a patent for the first time. And five years in a row, the patent examiner rejected it. And everybody at the hospital said, you know, I'm wasting a ton of money. I should just give up. But, but I don't like to give up. And so I started to think, how could we convince the patent examiner to allow the patent? You know, legally, of course. And, um, and science wasn't really working. But I told you in the beginning when we did this, everybody told me it was impossible. It would never, uh, it could never work. I wondered, maybe somebody wrote that down. So I did the science citation search in 1982. And, and I found this quote. Um, and it's by five of the top material scientists in the world. I'll just read it to you. Generally, the agent to be released is a relatively small molecule with a molecular weight no larger than a few hundred. One would not expect that macromolecules, for example, proteins, could be released by such a technique because of their extremely small permeation rates. However, Folkman and myself have reported some surprising. So surprising, that's a really good word for a patent examiner. That, 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 that shows the opposite. So uh, we showed this to the people in the hospital, and they talked to the patent examiner. And the patent examiner said, gee, I had no idea. He said, I tell you what. I'll allow this patent if Dr. Langer can get written affidavits from each of these five people that they really wrote that. Um, so I wrote them. It's a, it's a true story. By the way, it's a very good way to get a patent to see what people wrote about you. Uh, at any rate, and, 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 uh, and he said, if I could get those affidavits, then he'd allow it. And all of the people were nice enough to write me back that they wrote it, and we got this. And, and then we actually licensed it to several big companies. And I was so excited. I got, a, I got a consulting fee, a big research grant, and I thought they were gonna do a lot of work. But they 
did a few experiments and kind of gave up. So Alex Klebanoff, one of my friends, said, Bob, we should start our own company. So we started this little company, Enzatech, with four of my students, and we started making products. And uh, I'll, I'll just show you uh, pictures of some of those and other things that we uh, did with various companies. But many, many products are now based on this. Uh, all kinds of ways of treating cancer, heart disease like drug-eluting stents, uh, ways of treating schizophrenia, many of the ways of, of opioid addiction and so forth. And, and so we kept doing this, you know, we kept doing the basic research in our lab and then st spinning off companies uh, or licensing things to companies. One of the other problems was with, with nanoparticles, sometimes they'd stick together and sometimes they'd be gobbled up by cells. So we came up with a way to stop that too. We added uh, polyethylene glycol to the outside of the surface, which kind of uh, is like a disguise. It's like almost having a lot of water so, the, so it doesn't stick to, they don't stick together and the macrophages don't eat them. So here's a video. He starts with a nanoparticle of anti-cancer drug. That gets encased in a plastic that releases the drug over time. That in turn gets a special wrapping that disguises the package as a water molecule to fool the body's immune system. And last but not least, the address where it should be delivered, a key that will only fit the lock of cancer cells. A lot of the don't know over the TV show did that, but they, they, you know, a lot of the clinicians tell me the cell doesn't get blown up like that. But <laughs> and, and 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 we originally did this for cancer, but we thought, well, we could use this for other things. And of course, in 2010, as was mentioned, myself and actually three other people, Nubar Afayan, uh, Derek Rossi, and and Ken Chen, we had this idea that maybe we could start a company to develop messenger RNA therapeutics. The idea, and I had consulted for Genentech for many years, we knew protein therapeutics were terrific. Most of the top selling drugs today are proteins, but it takes years to make them, and, and you, know, you have to grow up eggs or giant vats, and we thought we could uh, do much better messenger RNA if you just could put messenger RNA and protect it with a nanoparticle and deliver it, well, the whole, your body will make the protein for you. So you could make it really quickly, as I'll show you. And, and also you could treat different kinds of diseases that you could never treat before, like those inside a cell and so forth. So Moderna, actually, we have a pipeline of 24 pro 25 products in clinical trials. But of course, the most famous is, was, is COVID. And just to show you the timeline of what you can do. So on January 11th, a Chinese scientist uh, publish the sequence. You can calculate from the sequence what the messenger RNA should be in less than two days. You can make it and you don't need any reactors or anything to make it. Uh, you can encapsulate it in the nanoparticle. It was sent to NIH in, in just a little over a month. And the first patients were dosed just two months later. Uh, but just like I got a lot of skepticism, you know, what happens is a lot of scientists kept saying Moderna's like Theranos, it doesn't make any sense, it won't work. I'll just show you a headline that came out two months after this started from our local newspaper. So this is a, a lot, it, we were published the phase one data or talked about the phase one data in the clinical trial. But of course the Boston Globe talked to a lot of so-called experts who said, well, this isn't how you do science. Of course, six months later, uh, we broke the code, and, and, and you may know, we had 30,000 patients in this. This is now November, five, six months after this. We broke the code, and what was amazing is out of the 15,000 that were in the treated group, not a single one went to the hospital, not a single person died, and it was 94 to 95% effective. It's now approved. <laughs> but, 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 but if really the point I wasn't making, the point I'm trying to make over and over again is if you try to do things that are in an entrepreneurial fashion and you try to do things that people don't believe in, you know, you're going to get a lot of skepticism and a lot of criticism and, 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 and you can get ridiculed. I mean, that's, you know, not, not so long ago. I wanted to end on some nutrition points, you know, so over the years, different people read about what we did. I had this software entrepreneur come to see me, um, must have been about uh, 10 years ago. Here he is in my office. There's me, and, uh, and, and one of the problems he mentioned was nutrition. Two billion people uh, have, and you probably all know this stuff much better than me, but he knew we did different kinds of things, and, and he was saying, you know, one of the things that, one of the problems is, is an, an iodine deficiency, for example, has been, you know, it's terrific work that's been done 
to obviate that, but there's so many others like iron and vitamin A and so forth. And of course, a lot of people in the developing world, they want to put things in bullion and stuff like that. You want to boil it for hours and, and, and it, they just get destroyed. So he said, could you solve that? So what Anna Jacqueline and others in our lab did is we came up with a way to encapsulate uh, any of these things, iron or zinc or whatever, in such a way as I'll show you that you could make it stable. Uh, so the goal is could you boil it for two hours and nothing will happen? No change in color, no change in taste, and no losing activity. And then when you eat it, it all comes out. Uh, and uh, so that might seem impossible, but we examined a number of FDA-approved materials that are very inexpensive, found this one. We have some others now, too. But here's 11 different nutrients. This is in vitro, but 11 different nutrients um, and that, that, that we tested. This is all published in one of the science journals. But you can see, you take each one of them, and if you, uh, if you uh, boil it or do nothing, nothing happens. Those are the bottom lines. But if you put it like in stomach acid, simulated gastric fluid, all comes out in half an hour. And by the way, we've now done three clinical trials uh, like with places like ETH and others. The same exact thing happens in humans. Uh, and, and it's stable not only to, uh, you know, and, and we've done this with lots of different things now, but it's stable you know, to all kinds of things when we do this, to temperature, humidity, uh, light, and so forth. Uh, and, and, and so, um, you know, and, and, and it's gotten approvals from both the, you know, FDA and the United Nations uh, agencies to, you know, so, and so what we've done from an entrepreneurial standpoint, this is going to be my very last slide, is we've actually set up two entities, uh, part, one with the, the, with the help of the Gates Foundation, uh, Particles for Humanity, which is, you know, getting, uh, uh, producing the vitamin A system for the developing world. We hope that we might be able to launch that in a couple of years. Another, uh, based on our MIT license, we have a patent, actually, Bill Gates is uh, on the patent, but, um, and, and, uh, on this, and uh, we set, set up a company called Vitakey to apply this to all kinds of, of nutritional problems to create precision nutrition. So we're already working, for example, with Frontera, a big milk company in, in New Zealand, to put different things in milk that, that can help with nutrition. And some of the things that we're doing is, is you know, doing different types of things with materials and you know, trying to drive these things quantitatively and developing high throughput methods so that we can, you know, create all kinds of food and nutrition products for, uh, for, for, for people, hopefully all around the world. Anyhow, it's a pleasure to talk to you, and thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Langer. That was amazing. That was, do you have time for a few no, questions? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Do we have questions from the audience? Anyone like to... Venture a question to Dr. Langer. I have to say, it was this moment when you were speaking, and I put the Moderna piece together, and I'm like, I'm here. We're here. I have Moderna in my arm. Like, <laughs> like, thank you. I had this moment of like, well, thank you. It's, it's, by the way, it's not me. It's a, you know, it's three thousand people there, and they've just really worked so hard and done so. I mean, they were working around the clock to try to do this. So it's it's a lot of great people. It's just incredible. It's just incredible. So comments, questions, Dari, please. Just a quick comment, and when we talked about this um, a couple months ago, I didn't put all this together, but Tufts is really the academic leader in U.S. aid funding for nutrition innovation for, to address. Uh, um, and, and so our big new project led by Dr. Patrick Webb is nutrition innovation, taking mid-stage mid ideas and translating them to scale. So I think it would be terrific to think about how the Nutrition Innovation Lab, just just funded by USAID for for twenty five million dollars, could could work together with what you're doing and see if there's some synergies. Be, be delighted. Be yeah. delighted. Thank you so much. Absolutely. That'd be a great opportunity. Questions, thoughts, other people? A, yes, up, up. Karen. Uh, you're on the. I keep joining us on the other side of the room here. Karen's right behind you. Hi. I I'd like to know. Can you talk a little bit about if artificial intelligence and machine learning played any role in the development of any of these technologies? It, it pay, plays a little bit of a, of, of a role. I mean, we certainly have used that for different kinds of things in terms of, of figuring out what types of excipients might work best, you know, to, for, for what I'll call syringeability. We've published a couple of papers on things like that. So, uh, but I think there's a lot more artificial intelligence can do. The pro problem that you need 
you know, I think to apply artificial intelligence well is, is really good data sets, you know, where everything, you, where you just change one variable at a time, which isn't so easy in, in, a, in a lot of these things because we're changing so many just to try to, you know, get something to work in the right way. But I think there's a tremendous opportunity for art, artificial intelligence to help in, in, in a lot of different things. Fantastic. Here you go. I got a question here. Hi. I have a peanut allergy, and I've heard about new treatments using nanoparticles to treat allergies. If you're putting vitamin A and other nutrients into milk, is there ways of perhaps also putting in certain allergens such that infants or young children who are drinking these milks or eating these foods could start to develop allergy resistance? Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. I, 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 I don't see any reason why you couldn't. I mean, I think that's a very interesting idea. Do you have allergy background or just know? Yeah, yeah. I think it's a good idea. Thank you. I'll, I'll mention it to everybody, see what they think. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. I have a question for you. What's next? Well, there's a lot. You know, we're, so probably half our lab, you know, we, we have a big lab, over 100 people. You know, so we're working on a lot of things with the Gates Foundation. We're actually working, like, on vaccines you know, like a way that you could give a single shot and have what we call self-boosting vaccines. So we have a cocktail of nanoparticles that burst at different times. And it's particularly important, I think, for the developing world because a lot of people don't come back. But when I look at what's happened in this country, I think it could probably be helpful there too. We, we, we started working on this back in 2012. I mean, Bill Gates certainly was very visionary in terms of what he thought about for vaccines. We're also working on microneedle patches that you could ship all over the world, you know, and just it's like a Band-Aid that you could put on people and try to make them shelf stable. Um, you know, we're a, a whole other big project in our lab. Um, you know, which, which David certainly know, is, is, uh, is uh, tissue engineering. Can we make new tissues and organs from scratch? Can we make, um, you know, new organs and tissues on a chip and so forth? That, that's a great note to end on. Thank you. What's next? Dr. Langer, so much. We're so privileged I, to have you with my, us today as our pleasure. keynote speaker. Th thank you.